Hello, thanks. Uh, I'm Patrick's introduced the project. I'm Michael Mossbacker, the editor of Brussels Signal. Uh, we've all, if you really want to see what we're doing, we've already published 1,500 pieces on our site since it started. So have a look, see see what see what we've done. Judge us on what we've uh, what we've covered so far. The theme of tonight's evening is free speech and uh, the challenges to free speech. There's been an endless Fake news and disinformation are the sort of big buzzwords uh, and issues at present. And I mean, they're genuine. I mean, they're genuinely the problem of fake news and disinformation. But it would be my view that the way this should be tackled, there seems to be a sort of group thinking in Brussels that the way is greater regulation, greater press regulation, greater regulation of social media. But we posit that that wasn't the way to go ahead. The way to tackle false ideas, bad ideas, appalling ideas is to challenge them. Uh, I mean, in the most extreme form in the last few, last two weeks, we've seen the most appalling pro-Hamas content all over social media. Is really the, and the European Commission said uh, this should be taken down, this shouldn't be allowed on there, this should be censored. Is that really the way or is the, or is the way to challenge those sort of arguments, to criticise that, to say this is appalling content on there? And our view is that debates the debates the way forward rather than more government control, more regulation, more uh, more state interference. Uh, got two speakers tonight. Louise Perry is our first speaker. Uh, I first published Louise in 2019. Two previous magazines than this. First in Standpoint magazine in 2019, and then uh, she wrote essays for me at the Critic uh, later on. Their subjects included a feminist defence of Jordan Peterson and uh, an essay on the joys of housework, the domestic value of housework. Anyway, Louise. Michael, you actually, you, you gave me my big break, actually. So it's, now is the moment to thank you for that and also to thank um, Russell Signal for having me. So the brief was um, some reflections on free speech and I, I, I prepared some remarks on the train over. Um, it seemed like a particularly... Um, uh, a painful but an important moment to be to be thinking about these issues in Europe. So centuries from now, <clears throat> if we have managed to produce any historians, which is not a given, I'm sorry to say, I suspect that they are going to find our current era very interesting indeed. Why was it, students of history will wonder, that the guiding ideology of the American empire and its European vassal states, that means us friends, shifted so suddenly in the second half of the 20th century? I don't think they will use words like wokeness or political correctness to describe this new ideology. Rather, I think they will call this historical event the Second Reformation, in recognition of its being contiguous with the First Reformation. While our ancestors of the 16th century went to war against Catholicism, we have gone to war against Christianity per se, and our world has been turned upside down as a consequence. Happily, the Second Reformation has not been nearly as bloody as the First, at least within the West, Ours has been mostly a cold conflict, and in general, I would say that Europeans nowadays are too old, too rich, and too fat to be much interested in taking to the streets, although we must not be complacent about the possibility for hot war in the future. The scenes in European cities over the last fortnight ought to remind us to be vigilant against the possibility of armed conflict returning to Western Europe. Still, despite the relative peace of our own experience of religious war, there are many instructive parallels to be drawn between the Second and the First Reformations. For instance, on the question of symbolism. I used to look with bemusement at the Reformation interest in transubstantiation, that is the question of whether consecrated bread and wine literally becomes the body and blood of Christ. Who cares, I used to think, what an odd thing to fight over. But I have now found a question that may help the contemporary mind to understand, on an emotional level, what was at stake in the conflict over transubstantiation. It is a question that continues to confound political leaders across the West, ending careers and seeing police action taken against those suspected of hate crimes. It is this question, do women have penises? Now answer carefully. Your livelihood may well depend on the answer, particularly if, you're, if you work in one of the many institutions that has been captured by the children of the 1960s revolution. These revolutionaries will be quick to describe your biological essentialism as a kind of violence, even while they condone the actual violence committed by Hamas against innocent Israeli civilians. The absurdity is the point. 
The inconsistency is the point. The hypocrisy is the point. What we are talking about when we talk about seemingly bizarre matters of symbolism is power. To look a person straight in the whites of their eyes and tell them that water isn't wet and to see them give way to your position without demur is to demonstrate your power over them. Now, there are some people, particularly on the centre left, who dismiss this fussing over rainbow flags and taking the knee as just so much culture warring. How trivial this all is, they say, while they hurriedly jog backwards in the face of an advancing enemy. They assume that we will return to normal before long, that we will passively return to our great liberal traditions of free speech and civil debate if only we meet the revolutionaries halfway. The unfortunate truth, though, is that true liberalism is a long way from being the human default. I think often of these lines from the final letter written by the 20-year-old Thomas Aikenhead, who was the last person to be executed for blasphemy in Great Britain in 1697. On the day before he was hanged at the age of 20 for saying, among other things, that he preferred Muhammad to Christ, poor dumb Aikenhead protested against his cancellation. Quote, it is a principle innate and co-natural to every man to have an insatiable inclination to the truth and to seek for it as for hid treasure. Beautiful lines, but if only he were right. Alas, an insatiable inclination to the truth is not necessarily to be found in every man, and a political system that prizes such inclinations is a rare and precious thing. The culture war conscientious objectors are wrong to think that drifting back towards a liberal consensus is both natural and inevitable, not least because, as Aikenhead shows us, we were executing people for blasphemy in Western Europe up until really quite recently. Free speech norms do not emerge and endure passively. Many people do not want to permit their political enemies to speak freely. If given the opportunity, the power hungry will censor their opponents in exactly the way that we are seeing today. This dark urge in human beings must be controlled through laws and norms that are continually defended. Such laws and norms both enable and are also symptomatic of a flourishing society, a society in which people trust their institutions and trust each other. The problem that we're facing right now is that the ideology that has emerged from the Second Reformation is hell-bent on shredding that trust by inflaming ethnic tensions, setting children against their parents, tearing down statues, and encouraging perpetual revolution. Not only does this ideology regard free speech as suspect, it also serves to undermine the conditions within which strong free speech norms can be sustained. Which is exactly why this ideology must be taken so seriously, and why it is so important that people in positions of influence have the courage to resist demands to repeat absurdities. To seek for the truth, in the words of Thomas Aikenhead, as hid treasure. The truth is a kind of treasure, and it can all too easily be lost. Thank, thank you. Uh, there'll be opportunities for there'll be op some opportunities for questions after both speakers have spoken. Uh, just, uh, Justin Stairs will be coming up in a moment, uh, who's the head of news, runs the news operation for Brussels Brussels Signal uh, at Industry Constantine. If you want to read more of Louise's work, uh, I'd recommend The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, which was her book, which came out last year. Mm -hmm.